from New York City and the studios of Media Training Worldwide, this is Inside Communications, and I'm your host, Mike Bako. Today on the show, a PR executive that not only has won the PR News Executive of the Year, but also his blog has won the PR News Blog of the Year. Today on Inside Communications from Flatiron Communications and the blog, The Flack, Peter Himmler, coming up next on Inside Communications. Thanks for joining us today on Inside Communications. My pleasure, Mike. So how much of a game changer has social media been in the PR world? Well, if you believe the press, it's been a, a sea change. But uh, what I found is that the goals of all of my clients have not changed much. Every client wants a positive branded presence in the media. Now, of course, the media has changed, it's splintered, it's fragmented, specialized, niche, blogs, etc., as well as the way to achieve that goal. So it used to be you work top down, you pitch a journalist, you convince that journalist to write about your client or go on the air about your client. Uh, but now we have the ability to create content, syndicate it, optimize it, whatever, and get it out there so it reaches audiences directly. You also have shared media. You, can, you have curated media. So there are a lot of different ways to achieve that goal. But the goal, at least from what I'm seeing, has not changed. People want, companies want their a positive brand of presence for their products and services in the media. So they want that, but are they seeing the evolution of those things that you're speaking about? When you are going into pitch meetings, when you are giving them the game plan for what's going to happen, do they still just want to be on the Today Show, or are they seeing that there are those influencers out there, there are those bloggers, people that tweet, people that have a high presence on, on Facebook and on YouTube, are they seeing that, or is that still a tough sell? You know, it's funny, for most clients, they still like traditional media and most of the industry continues that continues to be the, the measure by which they are being paid and, and appreciated um, and in fact you know Eula Packard I think did a, a study a year ago and they analyzed all of these tweets and they found that of the I don't know how many tweets that they analyzed virtually most most of the conversation originated with traditional media <laughs> so it is very important uh, traditional media, the New York Times, etc., can catalyze conversations, but you have a whole bunch of new influencers out there, and uh, you know, you've got to understand what crosses the New York Times journalist's email box every day. I mean, it used to be 50, 100 emails a day, now it's 500. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I tell my clients, and I've been working a lot with digital startups, is that you've got to find the influencers who may not be the big brand, branded traditional outlets. And those outlets happen to follow those influencers. And that's one strategy. So, And you mentioned, let's take a step back to Twitter. How do you do it well? Who's doing it well? What are some of the pitfalls that companies, individuals fall into using Twitter to almost just funnel out information as opposed to getting that interaction and engagement? from people. Uh, I think Twitter's very misunderstood, you know. Um, I think that a lot of people feel, oh, I need a Twitter account. I need to start, you know, broadcasting what I'm doing and what the company is doing, etc. But really, the, what you do with Twitter is you have to listen first. And there are a lot of tools out there. In fact, I wrote a blog post recently on how to mine Twitter on my blog. And, um, and there are a lot of new tools out there that will help you identify those voices, those people that are catalyzing conversations that are very influential. So the first thing you do if you're going to get into Twitter on behalf of an enterprise or a product or service or whatever is to find, to listen, okay, and follow. Okay, and you build up those lists, you build up those, your follower lists, and that's, that's key. It's who you follow, it's whom you follow that's more important than what you're saying. Um, once you begin to follow, you can begin to engage or interact. You can retweet smart things, and those journalists start to know you, you know? Because every journalist has a bit of an ego. And it doesn't hurt when you hashtag someone or you link to exactly. someone and they see that connection. Where's this coming from? Oh, okay, it's from this tweet, it's from this blog. Right. 
I'll tell you, um, you know, I get notes back from folks that I would never know, I mean, that are very, very influential. And it's just because I retweet their stuff or I, I push their stuff out there. I don't do it gratuitously. You know, you don't want to. I was going to ask, is there know? a danger in just becoming known as someone who retweets, who tries to repurpose things and not coming up with their own original content and ideas? I, I think curation is really important. And so as, it's as important as creating original content. So if you're a good curator and you find stories that are a timely and interesting to your sphere of followers, you'll get more followers. You mentioned your blog and how you wrote a, a post on, on tweeting. Mining Twitter. Mining yeah. Twitter. So what's the difference between your company website and your blog, The Flack? Um, you know, I started the flack in 2005, April of 2005, and, and, and you probably know that the name the flack is a pejorative in PR circles, and I tell people when it was born, it was born in a gawker moment. So uh, the fact of the matter is, is that it was started in sort of an irreverent time, and blogs were irreverent at the time. And um, I, I suppose my feeling is that PR permeates everything that we read and see in some way, okay? And so what the blog intended to do was to actually go open the curtains a little bit. I think we're a very misunderstood profession. And so if we can shed light on some of the thinking behind a big story in the news, whether it's the Apple iPhone announcement today and what the plans are and how Apple has used these big events and, and you know, their founder on the stage, mm -hmm. um, that, that's helpful. Um, my my uh, website uh, for Flatiron Communications is really the kind of work I do, how the business model that I have and the type of people that work with me to serve as clients and my approach. Have you found that clients also look at the flack, the blog, and see your thinking on different things that don't necessarily come up in terms of your past clients or things that you've done, but they see your thoughts on other ideas and think, Hey, you know what? We can integrate this into what we're doing, or he's he's got a progressive. Mindset you know, I haven't things. used the flack as a repository on strategy. Mm -hmm. It's really these are the services, these are the clients. This is how I approach my client work. Uh, you know, if you really want to delve into what I think about. PR, you know, I mean, uh, go on to the flack, and that'll that'll give you a good sense of it. Okay. Uh, I mean, it goes back five years or six years, so you got plenty of content and, there. And you've certainly ridden the wave of new technology and new things coming into existence. And Fear of being a dinosaur. I mean, I, you know, listen, I used to run the media practices at Edelman, at Burson, Hill, and all. And so I, I, I always try to stay on top of what the latest tools, techniques, and strategies are. And as we began to see a, a, this this wave, this change, I, I said, look, now is more important than ever to stay on top of it. So I started writing the blog early. I got on Twitter early. I got, you know, so I, I engage in the social graph pretty uh, actively. And I think it's important for PR people to do that. It's one thing to talk about Facebook strategies, even LinkedIn, um, or, or uh, there's so many ways, Google Plus now, I'm very active in, but you've got to be engaged. You've got to be tooling. You've got to be playing with it. So you're very engaged in Google Plus. This is interesting because a lot of people have accounts through Gmail, through, through different yeah. avenues, but yeah. the majority of people just have an account. It's almost like a placeholder. How active are you in Google Plus and what exactly are you doing? I mean, it's quite, you know, do you, the, the big question is, do you post to your Facebook wall? Do you post, post to your Google Plus wall? Do you po post to your Twitter? feed. Um, you know, what I've done is um, I use Ping FM, mm -hmm. and so if I post to Twitter, it automatically fed to LinkedIn and to Facebook, and I found a Chrome, a Google Chrome extension that allows that Twitter tweet to go on to Google+. Great, Plus great too. time saver. Yeah, so rather than having to post to different channels, you're able to post to one, and it's, it goes across a bunch of others. And what's nice about Google Plus is that you can post your thoughts to different circles. So I have a business circle, I've got technology friend circle, I've got my family, you know. And do you think that that could be a game changer, what Google Plus is doing in terms of building these communities, building these chat hubs and different things like that, where like-minded people, people in certain circles can get together and speak? It's the million dollar question right now. I mean, Facebook, as you know, just did 
did a total revamp. They introduced Timeline. I think uh, what some of these sites are doing is trying to get as much content about the individual that's posting as possible so they can monetize that content. They can go to an advertiser and say, look, look at all the details we have about this person. That's what Facebook is Certainly anyone doing. on Facebook can't go to their page anymore without seeing those banner ads down the side for, yeah, yeah. for items and things that, that they're either searching or looking for or right. tag or anything like that. Well, contextual that. advertising has been around for a while, but you know, if you post something that you did five years ago, you started, you know, I mean, you know, Facebook is making a play for everything about you, and, and they're doing it so they can monetize it for their advertisers. Let's take one more step back. You were mentioning people not using Twitter effectively. One of the other buzzwords is viral videos. Is that just a horse that people are going after and they're just never going to win with it because who knows what's really going to be a viral uh, you know, video? I love that a client comes to you, let's create a viral video. <laughs> well, you can't create a viral video. Videos go viral because there's something in them that makes them uh, enamoring to those that see them. Um, I, you know, I've written about this, but I wrote about it a while ago from the perspective of the PR perspective versus the advertising perspective. So, for example, um, there was a video that I saw on YouTube that showed a SUV or a minivan coming down a New York City street and, and riding in front of a, a construction site. And all of a sudden, one of those big construction balls comes out of the construction site, hits the broad side of the minivan, flips it over, and the person emerges from the minivan. I'm thinking, oh my God, that's unbelievable that happened in New York City. And it was shown as if it was a news, that it would happen on the news, and someone just happened to get it with a camera. Well, it turns out it was a viral video created by the car manufacturer. I mean, you would have read about it in the Daily news, I suppose, if that happened on the streets of New York City. And, and there was no identification except that they knew who the car maker was. Mm -hmm. Now that's over the line, you know, in a way. And you see a lot of that in the, I think the advertising people don't, they don't understand the importance of disclosure. You know, we used to do VNRs and we mm -hmm. put them out there and you had to identify who mm -hmm. the client was, who was paying for this. But now there's a lot of video that crosses the line and doesn't identify, but it enhances as a brand in some way, and I think that's a big issue. So how does that get fixed, or is that something that that buzzword won't be used in another year or two, or will people always be chasing after that elusive goal? You know, you, you wonder, so, you know, some brands won't want to cross the taste line, and some will. Okay, I mean, GoDaddy, for example, will do crazy stuff to get their videos out there to go viral. Mm -hmm. And then you have brands like Old Spice, where you know you had the guy, and that, that, those videos went viral, and they weren't tasteless. They were fun and mm -hmm. quirky. And so, what are the ingredients? How do you, how does a video go viral? And 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 that's the the million another million dollar question. You know, uh, there was one firm I, I read about that actually laid out this is how you make a video go viral. I don't believe it. You know. What do you believe we'll be seeing in a year or two? We, we spoke about Twitter, we spoke about Google+, Plus. we're now talking about viral videos. What's next on the horizon that's somewhat under the radar but that you're seeing picking up some traction? Well, in a way it's not a good thing for the PR industry. I mean, if in fact most of the industry is still working through gatekeepers to, to engage, to try to convince them to do stories, the fact is is that these gatekeepers are overwhelmed with pitches. They're, I mean, I think I read there were three to one PR people to journalists mm -hmm. nowadays, you know? And then the automation... Of, a lot of failed journalists becoming PR people. Right. And the automation of media relations also has enabled PR people to just blast out innocuous or irrelevant pitches to myriad journalists. And it's, it's made it much, much harder. So journalists are getting their news ideas and story ideas from a bunch of different sources. They can create, obviously, a Google reader. They can create news.me. There are so many tools out there that can actually help curate for them and bring in ideas to them. And so that's a danger. I think a year from now, it's going to get harder for PR people, you know. Uh, is there a danger in, as you mentioned, pitching, over-pitching a journalist just to pitch them, getting into their inbox and then just seeing you and then getting to the point where they just delete you without even looking at it? Can you pitch someone too much? You know, what I found is the, the issue is not pitching the journalist too much, it's pitching the right journalist with the right story at the right time of day. I mean, you don't want to be pitching a tech journalist today 
when Apple is having a major news conference in Cupertino. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have to know that. You know, um, I think. Look, I think good story ideas will rise, and and I think that. Okay, so it's not the journal, so maybe it's the next web, or maybe it's um, another site like Mashable, or not the Mashable. Mashable is a, is a, is an, a, a huge uh, mm -hmm. mainstream outlet as well right now. I don't know if you saw the New York Times story this week about Mashable, but mm -hmm. so I think lower sites look at influencers. I think make sure that you do your homework and you have the right journalist. I won't pitch a journalist until I go onto that site and find out if in fact the journalist is the right journalist. Um, you can't rely on some of these automated services to give you a targeted media list and just blast out to that list without doing your homework. You can't. Yeah. It'll hurt you. You'll hurt a relationship. Yeah. Okay, and let's wrap up with an event that you have coming up at the beginning of November. Oh, well, you know, I, I do, I've been running the Publicity Club of New York for about 10 years now, and every six weeks or so we do meet the media. And I, a lot of the stuff that I know and I've learned about the way media likes to work with PR people has been, uh, has been through the Publicity Club. But on November 1st, we're going to do, we're going to look at travel and tourism. And we've got a fabulous panel, Wall Street Journal, Peter Greenberg, big freelancer. We'll have one of the major magazines. It's uh, Midtown. If you go to Publicity Club.org, you will uh, will hopefully get it up there this week. So okay, great. Yeah. We'll look for that. And thanks for going Mike, inside communications. My with pleasure. Us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good. Awesome. <laughs>